number of couples, I've always made it a point to make sure that when I got to the venue or to the church, that I would get permission to go and see both the groom, and that's not a big problem, but the bride, right? I always tell the maids of honor or the, the, her wedding party, uh, can I come back and see her? Uh, well, yeah, she's ready. I, uh, just let me see her. You know, and I want to walk up. Oh, she's beautiful. She's beautiful. It's taken her seven days to get that way, but she's beautiful. Okay. Now the guy, he can get ready in fifteen minutes, right? Okay. And and if it if it's still dirty, he just sprays some cologne on it, and it's okay, right? Okay. <laughs> but before I marry a couple, I want to look them in the face. Normally, I tell everybody else to hush or go go get in the corner of a room, and I want to look into their face, and I want you to tell me that you're ready for this. Are you ready for this big leap of faith? Life is going to change in about 15 minutes. The bride here gets ready. How, how does the church get ready? Uh, does she put her makeup on? Does the church have her hair done? No. And I want you to look down in your outline because I think there are four ways that the church readies herself. The first thing is, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the rapture could take place at any moment. Every once in a while, seriously, every once in a while, I look around at where I'm at and I ask myself, if Christ returned today and raptured the church, what would happen? Woof! just like a big vacuum cleaner, just taking us up. It's going to be the right of our life, okay? It's going to be in the twinkling of, that's it. It's going to be so quick. We prepare ourselves for the rapture. We are always ready. Secondly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're told that we will be before the Lord who is on his Bema seat. Uh, Maybe something like this. But that's where rewards will be handed out. You and I need to keep working for Jesus because what we're doing now, once we get to heaven, cannot be done by us. You can't evangelize people in heaven. You can't give away Bibles in heaven. Um, We have to do that down here now, right? So we're preparing for that Bema seat experience. And by the way, that's when the judge would actually give a reward to the person who won the athletic contest and did it by the rules, by the book. And so we prepare ourselves for that day. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, We prepare ourselves because we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And you and I, It'll take just a few words, and that will carry with us for all of eternity. Ready? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Listen, folks, to me, that's all the reward I need. How about you? Now, by the way, I would like a T-shirt, okay? I mean, I'd like a T-shirt. Lynn won't let me take them to heaven. By the way, if anybody wants T-shirts, when I'm gone... It, they're in the top drawer, all right? Just have any T-shirt you want. But I want a T-shirt, and I want it to say, I'm here to stay, right? <laughs> all right, okay. All right. Now, thirdly, I think we prepare for the feast, the marriage celebration. Uh, you prepare for that day. Uh, I, I came yesterday for breakfast, even though I got up at about 5, 5.30, I didn't eat any breakfast until 9 o'clock, and by that time, I was good and hungry. Matter of fact, I was even stealing bacon from Brett, okay? All right? (laughs) Okay? Uh, We might not be eating a whole lot knowing that that, that, that's coming up. It's going to be a feast. I believe that we're preparing for the millennial reign, Revelation chapter 20, that you and I will reign with Christ here on earth for a thousand years. Wow. Uh, You might want to go take horseback riding lessons because some of us might be on horses, all right? If you rode a horse as a child, just kind of remember that, okay? All right? 
Uh, but these are the ways that the church prepares. In verse 8, she will be adorned with fine linen, clean and bright. And the Bible calls that the righteous acts of the saints. Now, wait a minute. You and I know this in Isaiah, I think, chapter 64. Look with me later at my notes if you need that reference. But I believe that in about verse 9 or 10 of Isaiah 64, it says, Our righteous acts are as filthy rags. So what is it saying here? Is this in contradiction? No, it's not. Because these are things that Christians do not in our rebellion, not in our trying to reach heaven like the Tower of Babel. We've trusted Christ as our Savior. We've worked for Him. We've followed Him. We've obeyed Him. We've done what He asked us to do. And I would like to just kind of say this. Oh my goodness, a third original thought. Here it comes. I believe that as Jesus died for our sins, we will be covered by His righteousness. That's what the Bible says. But I think that somewhere in there, our clothing will also be the things that we did for Jesus. May I say this? If I'm wrong, the Lord will correct me. But Jesus dying for our sins gives us the covering. As you and I serve Jesus, it gives us the comfort. Now, may I say it this way? When we get to heaven, that we could honestly look into the face of our Savior and say, I, I tried to serve you the best I could. I didn't waste my talent. I put it to use. You asked me to sing. You asked me to serve as a deacon. You asked me to be a pastor. Uh, and the best I thought I could do it, I, I tried that. I think there's comfort in being able to look at Jesus and say that but I feel like I've tried to serve you the best I could. In verse 9, John was told to write, and by the way, I think that's a great point about the inspiration of the Word of God. Every word that you see in this book, God spoke to somebody and said, hurry, get a piece of paper and a pen, write it down. That means that God's Word, 2 Corinthians 3.16, every piece of it, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And John was told to write. There's a couple of things I want to say, and actually I want to begin closing, but I've got more things to say. But let me draw your attention to this. When we take a look at passages of Scripture, uh, look at verse 10, uh, uh, the Spirit, the testimony of Jesus is the Spirit of prophecy. Everything Jesus spoke about has come true or will come true someday. He looked out the future. He told the disciples, I'm going to die. Uh, they'll bury me. I'll rise from the dead. Forty days later, after that re uh, uh, resurrection, uh, he told the disciples, I'm, I'm coming back. And he ascended up into heaven. Everything Jesus said was a prediction. And when we take a look at some of the things Jesus said, he also said them in parable form. Now, let me help you, and we're going to transition into communion. One day, early in Jesus' ministry, he performed a miracle. He changed water into wine, John chapter 2. It was in Cana of Galilee. That couple invited Jesus to their wedding before they had trouble. Get the point? You see, they didn't know that they were going to run out of drink, right? But they had invited Jesus before the trouble started. Folks, we invite Jesus into our situation before the trouble begins. In other words, we let him be present. Matthew chapter 25 tells the story of the ten virgins, five wise and five unwise. The unwise ones forgot their oil. That parable tells us, be prepared any day. Be prepared. 
In Matthew chapter 8, we see the parable of the wedding banquet for the king's son. And people were invited, but they turned down the invitation. And so the servants went out and invited everybody, but they had to put on a white robe to be in the ceremony. But one man did not. And he was kicked out of the ceremony because he was not properly dressed. He still had his filthy rags on, Isaiah 64, 6. He did not have a white robe that was required to be in the wedding. We see the Lord's Supper. At the end of every gospel, it is highlighted and outlined for us that Jesus took the bread and broke it, and he said, this is my body. He took the cup, and he said, this is my blood shed for you. He also said that he would not drink of the fruit of the vine again until they were in the kingdom of God. So in essence, we practice this in preparation for that great day. And then lastly, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, we use this a lot. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, here it comes. I will come into him and sup with him, dine with him, fellowship with him. And so there's a proper place for Christ to be. It's a now relationship that lasts for eternity. Those five points make Jesus present, be prepared, be properly prepared, practice his presence, and make sure that he's in place in your life. I'm going to ask you to bow your hearts and your heads with me. And as I think about these points in Jesus' ministry, then it leads me to understand a bit better what we're about to participate in. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, we had a hymn, His Name is Wonderful, I'm going to ask Mel to play that, and if you can sing that uh, just from heart, from your memory, then do so as the servers, deacons, come to the front for me. His name is wonderful. If you need to peek at the words, it's 118. Just remain in your seats. His name is wonderful. As we consider breaking the bread and sharing the cup, it's His name that's wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty one. Master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. Most thou gracious Jesus, my Lord.